Here is a knowledge lecture for the various titles of the perfected Illuminati. The first title is District. This title refers to the position of due guards outside the once and future Senate of Camelot and of Atlantis. The district directors referred to in the literature of the modern IOBB2, Illuminati Order Bulletin Board 2, are the outermost watchmen of the order. Usually eight to ten meet together, but in an emergency, only as few as four or five need to attend. The Illuminati Order has been in a declared state of emergency since its inception in 1776 and subsequent expulsion from Bavaria. Therefore, no fewer than five members need to be present to actively constitute a lodge, which does not need to have walls. A lodge or club can meet in an ale hall or can convene in a wooded clearing like a coven. The role of the due guard in an open lodge is to collect the proper grip and password. The grip should be given by the left hand to the guard on the right side, and the password, if on one's person, passed with the right hand to the due guard on the left. At the same time, all three, both due guards standing guard outside the door of the lodge, and the person seeking to gain entrance to that lodge should then say the proper phrase for that lodge. The role of the district director in a closed lodge is to follow the lodge ambassador, the Scottish Rite Templar level of POD, and the regional directors, the Rosicrucian Golden Dawn of POD, and only sit on the bench after they have. We keep one eye always on the nearest door and one eye always on the nearest window. We trust the regional directors and they trust the lodge grand masters. We watch the regional director convey the report of the lodge ambassador to the lodge grand master, the Essene York Rite in POD who would then convey the report to the area directors, the Bohemian OTO of POD. However, if the report is delivered any farther than this, we must wait for a special sign to be given from within, and this sign will let us know how to act in accord to the password presented within by ourselves as the due guard from the person seeking to gain entrance. There are five seats for every bench, and we are the ones that occupy the seat on the end closest to our lodge's door. Next to us sits the regional Rosicrucian. Next to the regal Rosicrucian representative from our lodge sits the Templar ambassador, the Tyler, or guardian at the great stained glass windows behind the bench. He sits facing away from the Senate proceedings, looking out at the window, keeping watch, just as we sit straddling the bench, facing away from our lodge brothers, looking back toward the door, keeping watch for Cowans, peeping Thomases, and spies. We are the larger part of the armed regiment, there are ten of us that guard outside the Senate doors, two at the door into each lodge, and we take the passwords and give the grips. The other armed guards are the Tylers, but they stay inside for the most part. Inside the Senate, everything is arranged like a giant cobweb. If there is a fly caught in one area, Immediately, all the spiders in all the other areas will know. On each lodge bench sit five wise senators. There are the due guard, the attendant, the tiler, 
the Grand Master, and the chair for each of the four elements, for water, for fire, for air, and for earth. In the center there are three pillars, each with a chair next to it. The four benches and the three pillars are the twenty-three seats of the Senate. However, the number of senators present and in attendance at any time is not strictly set to that combination of numbers. For example, when convening an ecumenical senate, the fifth lodge is closed and a spirit lodge is opened with a bench of four senators, limiting the other elemental lodge benches also to four senators. Just as there is a difference between the total number of senators and the total number of votes, so too is there a difference between the number of Illuminati that can constitute a lodge. It is said that usually five meet, and that they are then considered an invisible hand of the Illuminati. However, just as four must find one to three, so too must five find one or two, and one or two is one fewer to find than one to three. The goal in forming an Illuminati hand, known amongst the Church of the Subgenius as a stark fist or clutch, is to advance it to become a church comprised of one OTO degree, two Illuminati degree, and three Rosicrucian degrees, or to constitute an executive committee, the stark fist of removal or retrieval in subgenius lingo, of seven members. Think of Illuminism as like a political party among the modern church and state of the perfect order. However, Illuminism, Rosicrucianism, the chivalric and philosophical degrees of masonry, as well as the modern bohemian OTO, all collectively known as the Bund degrees of the order, are more than merely political paradigms. They are psychological patterns formed naturally whenever certain numbers of people meet in groups. The savage pecking order of the watering hole demonstrates this point across many levels. Just as does a church convene of six and an executive council of seven, so does a clutch of Illuminati convene of five. Just so, in every group of seven, the dominant one will guide the philosophies of four though they will betray one, and one will betray them. Such are the seasons of the Pope played out in every group of seven. Seven is less stable than six, but more stable than five. One of the chief goals of Illuminism is to restore Atlantean democracy. To do this, the Illuminati have reconstructed the Senate with an odd number of members, all of whom, save the Pope, may be trusted to not abstain, in order to ensure a regular flow for the law. The Illuminati are particularly interested in expanding upon the fractal of odd primes. The second sign of the Illuminati is the color yellow. The sun symbol of the Illuminati is the circle with a dot at the center. It is a symbol for a total solar eclipse, similar to the Mobius strip symbol for the duality of positive and negative infinity manifesting in the sun and moon. A similar symbol is the symbol of the Tao, or the Wei, in Chinese Zen. Here we see the familiar yin-yang motif, however with a twist. We see the sun and moon pass through each other, like a dragon eating its tail. The opposite tint of yellow is blue, but the opposite hue of light 
from yellow is violet. Thus, the true opposite of yellow would be something similar to an average between blue and violet, namely indigo. However, if you examine the light of the eclipse, you will see that an indigo sun surrounds a blue moon to produce violet light in the sky. Because the local sun is yellow, everything that we see, each photon that strikes our eyes, has been spun more toward the yellow portion of the spectrum before and after being reflected off any object. The opposite of this light source, then, is not the absence of it such as at night. It is the ultraviolet sky scorched away of the yellow hue and made crystal clear during a solar eclipse. The indigo sun represents Tifereth and the blue moon Yesod. We see the alignment of the sun and moon occurring on May 5th, 2000, and we see it occurring again on December 21st, 2012. Yesod means the foundation, and Tifereth means the beauty. So, when we look at the solar eclipse, what we are seeing is how everything looked in the Garden of Eden when the light source of the Creator was eclipsed from Paradise by the creation. Just as we discuss the astrophysical sun and the moon as individual elements to be of a lesser degree of force than the cosmological emanations of Tifereth and Yesod, that is, the product of their union, so too is the relationship between the lesser light of photons and the greater light of tachyons. Just as at night and during an eclipse, when the yellow light of the sun is removed, does the sky appear as it truly is, clear. So too is the difference between the photon fields of near zero mass and the tachyon wells of ZPE. Just as even only one single photon emits visible light radiation, Cherenkov radiation, so too is the tachyon, an invisible hypersphere that surrounds and permeates the photon. The closest approximation to understanding the tachyonic torus surrounding the photon would be to compare it to the differential rotation of the sun's gaseous surface as it winds up the longitudinal electromagnetic field lines until they become latitudinal. The reason for the sun's differential rotation is the precession of its EM poles, the same as our own here on Earth, which in both cases of our planet and our sun are offset from the actual geographical location of the mass's polar rotation. So each photon blazes and seethes with infinite tachyons in much the same way as a star is a nuclear furnace emitting near infinite photons. This light that we see emitted from a single photon, Cherenkov radiation, however, is colored like the sun's photons are, yellow. In order to see the true form of tachyons, you have to obscure the direct light of the photons. Once your eyes adjust, then you will be able to see more clearly the invisible patterns that appear in the empty air. Unlike stars and photons, the clear light of tachyons shines but does not burn. It is not a sign such as fire that consumes fuel for the flame to convert into smoke, nor is it a sign such as air that can be clear, cloudy, or stormy, nor like water that can be ice, liquid, or gas. It is like a combination of all three of these traits, water, fire, air, combined to describe the ether above However, just as the dot in the circle sun sign can be used to represent photons, so too can the alchemical sulfur sign stand for the clear light of tachyons. In sulfur are mixed chemical 
air, cloud, water, gas, and fire, smoke. It is the airiest of the air elements, yet its stench is associated with Satan. This is there to remind us to be sensitive to the change in smell of our setting. Remember that even a rarefied change, such as one in air temperature or pressure, can be a telling sign. And again, just as there may only be odor to remind us of the presence of sulfur, so too are invisible tachyons glittering gloriously along all levels impossible to miss once one is aware of them. And just as sulfur's tint is yellow, so too can the otherwise invisible tachyons be seen only when near an emission source, such as a photon, or in the gas jets of the poles of a black hole. This is the dual nature of light. There is the greater and the lesser. The greater light is tachyons. The lesser light is photons. The greater light is clear, but requires an object to eclipse between itself and its more massive counterpart, the photon, for its true and invisible patterns to become apparent. The more massive counterpart, the photon itself, radiates like a star such as our sun. Tachyons are so much smaller than the supposedly massless photon that they only even appear when their trajectories are Doppler shifted by the photon surface well. At this point they appear as Cherenkov radiation. Therefore, while the exoteric color associated with the Illuminati is yellow, the esoteric color of the Illuminati is actually clarity, the trance of Samadhi in Buddhism. Achievement of Nirvana to the Hindu, Christ Consciousness to the Western Mystics, Kether of Shekinah to the Kabbalist, Ego Death to a Psychologist. When the mind is clear of all motion of thought, when there is no electrical kinetic activity in the neural tissue of the cerebrum, then the emotions will become still and the heart will calm. As this happens, the light of the true sun will increase its brightness, and the invisible patterns will become clear, and the true illumination of God, that is, his vision and his voice, will come down upon you. It is because this method of clearing out the self allows the influx of God that this trance of clarity is called illumination. The light increases. The third symbol of the Illuminati order is the dodecahedron. When the Illuminati order was created by Adam Weishaupt, it was a very different organization than it is today as a branch of Freemasonry. In its initial conception, Weishaupt's Illuminati appealed to Freemasonry, however, by now, having been accepted into the Philosophical Lodge for some 200 years, Illuminism and Freemasonry have become irreversibly intermingled to the extent that Illuminism is considered the true Masonry, and that all former Masonry was a fallen and degenerate form of Illuminism. Consider, for example, the role of the Dew Guard. They are made aware of both the outside and the inside of the Lodge, as well as, originally, the inside of the Atlantean Senate as well. They stood guard outside the Lodge doors, entered in through the Lodge using the same passwords and grips as they themselves collected outside, and shared a seat on the Senate bench with all the other members of their lodge. However, since the time of Atlantis, the biblical city of Enoch, the high degree of civilization therein, was also lost. This treasure, however, was buried before the flood and survived underground, in one form or another, until the present. 
the keys to this high degree of civilization, are now the lost word and keys of Freemasonry. Illuminism's promise is to restore these. And in many ways it has. However, to accomplish this restoration, it has been set in counterpoint to the civilization and its values that has arisen in the interim. Christianity, the belief in a single ubermensch, pales by comparison to the global civilization of Atlantis. However, this is the best that the chattel can imagine for their perfect world. Therefore, to set the world into the proper order, much of the civilization that the chattel cherish must be destroyed. That is the burden of Illuminism. However, the movement within Freemasonry, known now as the Illuminati, did not begin until nearly 1776. It has had much fear of change and conservative reactionaries to contend with. It has only managed to advance the world as far toward global reunification in the past 200 years as global conflict and free trade, which is, obviously, quite a ways in terms of technological progress compared to the Dark Ages, however, still a long way from being Atlantis. The Renaissance Rosicrucianism that was resuscitated by Illuminism has impacted into science fiction dystopias, and the dreams of a new Atlantis are being stunted in some by tension over the Christian calendrical millennium. Among some, the success of Atlantean democracy is considered a mystery, and likewise, some venerate the ineffability of all such mysteries so much that they consider the entire endeavor to solve these mysteries, recover the lost keys of masonry, and restore Atlantis, collectively nothing but metaphysics and mysticism. These people comprise the present mode of thinking that Illuminism seeks to root out and to eventually completely overcome. These people venerate the veil without accepting the apocalypse of the abyss. That is why there is a division in the vision. The division, however, as it is manifest now, is one between church and state. This issue has caused there to arise two factions in the present order that preserves the perennial tradition. This division appears to be between the quasi-religion type degrees and the executive and administrative type degrees, i.e., between exoteric church and state. This is considered, by the modern chattel, the cornerstone of democracy. However, this is the main difference between modern democracy and Atlantean democracy. In Atlantis, there was no church. There was no need for one. This is the message of the Illuminati. However, though we are opposed to religion, we realize the need to enter into it in a modern times in order to dissolve it from within. This is the reason no church of the order can be recognized without one Illuminatus member. It may seem like it would probably be better if an Essene were allowed to take our place in the religious sphere, but it is necessary for all of us to achieve our goal that they should not. Illuminism is a movement of science. As such, we advocate deism. However, we are actually closest to atheists in our hearts. This does not mean we do not know and love God. It means we lack belief in the lesser God described to us by the chattel. Unlike the Rosicrucians, we will not work with the chattel by curtailing our curriculum to suit their tastes. We will not mince words and say, the Pope is the Antichrist, out of one side of our mouths, but say, Jesus is the true way out of the other. We tell the truth. 
man is God. This is why the teaching method of Ben Padia, do not cast pearls before swine, is the watchword of the wise man today. This is why much of what the Rosicrucians published as a compromise between the truth and Christianity is replicated without amendment or revision in the mass media today, not because we do not recognize the inherent errors in the grimoires, always on the side of Christianity, nor because we do not have easy access to the true content of these grimoires, but because we publish what will whet the appetite of those who otherwise would not seek truth at all. That, like the Rosicrucians, they should then seek us out. We have created the New Age movement of the modern mass media. It is the caricature of the New World Order movement in politics, the movement of globalism. Of course, the heads of the New World Order movement in politics do not need to understand astrology any more so than some fool in a Magic the Gathering group would be able to read the mind of the U.S. President. This is the continuing separation of church and state within the order. Neither the New Agers nor the New World Order proponents have foresight enough to see the restoration of Atlantean democracy, let alone to understand their own actions now by attempting to unify the world prematurely and thus religiously are only plunging the world into a necessary and a temporary chaos. The heads of state and the chiefs of the church are all, by now at least, Illuminati. The fourth meaning is given for the letter G, the force of gravity. Just as there is a weak force and a strong force of atomic energy, so too are there phased states for the force of gravity. The strong gravity force is photons, the particles being large enough for us to see with our bare eyes. The weak gravity force is tachyons. While the strong force seems integral to our perception and understanding of our universe, comprising the entire spectrum of visible radiation, that is, the EM force, it is the weak force of gravity that is actually more essential, anthropically, for the existence of our universe, because, by the involution of their surfaces, simultaneously moving forward and backward, they determine the directions of linear time. Some incorrectly associate the seeming strong and weak force of gravity with the terms gravity A and gravity B. In fact, gravity A is a term used to indicate micro subquantum gravity, and gravity B is a term used to indicate macro astrophysical gravity. The terms gravity A and gravity B are close enough for government work since they are commonly used by military physicists while micro and macro are used more by metaphysicians with the preferred terms among astrophysicists and quantum mechanics still being wells and fields based on EM type quantum characteristics. So if I say gravity wells occur on astrophysical levels and that gravity fields predominate on subquantum levels. You should understand that this means the same thing as saying gravity B is macrogravity and gravity A is microgravity. However, you should also bear in mind that macrogravity or gravity B, etc., is not one-to-one -one synonymous with the greater light of tachyons, and that microgravity, or gravity A, etc., is not one-to-one -one synonymous with the lesser light of photons. Instead, both gravities A and B, 
that is the microscopic and the macroscopic forces of gravity are relative to the greater light of tachyons. All this pertains to what the military calls ZPE or zero point energy, energy that exists below that of the massless photon. So the force of gravity is really above that of EM, the spectral emissions of light, as the greater light above the lesser, and the forces of microgravity, A, and macrogravity, B, are equal above, or rather they are equal, but both are lesser than the true light of tachyons. Gravity A and gravity B comprise the dual nature of linear time. However, time, being the fourth experiential, temporal, and fourth actual spatial dimensions, is actually one dimension lower than the fifth dimension of pure light, the clear light that illuminates tachyons. For just as tachyons shine through photons, causing their Cherenkov radiative light, so too does the true light of spirit shine through tachyons, causing their invisible involution. And even this dimension is only the outer gates of the prime mover. That is why the G of gravity is less than the G of geometry, and the G of geometry, that is the measurement of all space permeating all dimensions, is yet less than the G of God. This is, of course, how the ordered mind would order things. And, in the beginning, there was perfect periodicity. However, by now, having long since passed the point of universal critical mass, when the collapsed string dimensions begin to fray, and the shells shatter, and the universe begins producing a multiverse of baby universes inside black holes. All things appear aperiodic, warped, and distorted. So, even though the Rosicrucians were, in their time, able to communicate the ideal of perfect periodicity to the Christians, we Illuminati now see this as impossible to explain to the same audience for the reason of the Millennium's distractions. However, if we were to have to prove ourselves to the chattel, using the mystic mysteries of mathematics, to awe and astound them, we would have to go looking for the proper equations and relationships, not in periodicity, but in aperiodicity. There, we would confuse all the perfect terms to arrive at a suitably confusing, yet right, answer so as to confound the astounded masses. For example, take E equals MC squared. Everyone will assure you it is true, based on the evidence of the atomic bomb, but no one in all the lands can explain to you what exactly it means. There is to the chattel, the children of heaven, Christ called them, no repetition without modification, and the only non-compromisable thing is compromise. If quizzed by the chattel on the math of higher dimensions, which they will associate with their home, heaven, explain to them the following correspondences. Gravity is negentropic, attractive, and mnemonic. Time itself is entropic, repulsive, and fractal. Explain to them that entropy is the forward-flowing motion of the standard arrow of time. Explain to them that wells of gravity are themselves the statistical improbability and that one, like life itself, must struggle to come into existence and to maintain itself even for a relatively short time. Tell them, therefore, we use the term gnomon to refer to negentropic, gravitational, or living patterns, and the term fractal to refer to entropic, temporal, or dead patterns, 
even though in essence both are patterns themselves because they like a hologram replicate the same design on smaller and larger scales in this way you can explain hyperspatial mathematics even to a Bedouin Arab and you can discuss the nature of spirit even with an atheist rocket scientist therefore understand the pure claim of perfect periodicity but realize that though it is reflected like ripples in a pond it is not itself anywhere pure calm or periodic anywhere in this universe and the local universe is all the chattel are likely to ever know about. See, also, that tachyons carry the force of gravity over the force of electromagnetism, however that this reflects or reverses upside down beneath the speed of photons, such that photons appear on the surface to be the force of electromagnetism over the force of gravity. Therefore, even though these words have a somewhat different, more ideal meaning to us as Illuminati, to the chattel, you can explain to them that photons, represented by the yellow circle dot symbol of the sun, are actually weak gravity, and that these manifest themselves as forward-flowing, entropic fields of gravity. They will understand this. Then tell them that strong gravity is tachyons, manifesting as backward-flowing, negentropic wells of gravity. Tell them one is above and one is below. Then they will think they understand, and then they will know what you tell them is true. Explain to them that gravity wells are like the chakras, and that gravity fields are like the aura. Explain to them patiently about the holographic nature of light, but do not, by any means, attempt to explain to them that the chakras of the aura are equivalent to the karma of the soul. Do not attempt to explain to them that the true nature of gravity as temporal is relative to the spatial nature of photons, and do not attempt to explain to them anything yet about phi over pi. If you explain these things to the drones and the chattel, and if you show them the diagram, explaining to them the shape of the tachyon, then they might begin to get a grip on controlling their own finances by applying their newfound understanding, and we wouldn't want that. Instead, just show them the solar symbol of the Illuminati, the circle with the dot in the center, and tell them it is a cone. Instead, show them the eye in the triangle design, and explain to them it is a symbol of God, the all-seeing eye in the Trinity halo. But by no means explain to them the evaporation of currency value is equivalent to the withering away of the capitalist dictatorship by the proletariat through the micro-miniaturization of information transfer technologies. Do not let them understand that this evaporation of currency, water to air, is equivalent to the force of photons, gravity under EM, and that to generate income from this evaporation of currency is to use tachyons, gravitational water, over cosmological air or the electromagnetic force to foresee the future. Explain to them that God only knows the mysteries, but keep in mind at all times that to an Illuminati there is no ineffable mystery. The fifth title is Jupiter, King Among the Planetary Rulers. Just as there are various mysteries related to the Illuminati solar symbol, as there are various arrangements of the attributes it denotes, such as the greater and lesser light, tachyons, photons, etc., 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 so too are there multiple interpretations of Jupiter. 
Nowadays, to say Jupiter to the modern initiate, they may think of the Sephirot judgment or mercy. However, when we Illuminists refer to Jupiter, it is not in its Sephirot sense, but in its planetary sense as the Hebrew letter Tao, Gematria value 400. The history of Jupiter is many storied, but we must remember it was attributed to the planet first. Then from this did it become relative to a letter in the Hebrew Aleph Bet. Then from this did it become venerated by the Greeks. Then from this, in 20th century Kabbalah, it was associated with the Sephirah of judgment or mercy. This is the order of the history of its meaning. Throughout this history of exoteric meanings, however, there has been an esoteric current in which Jupiter has had another specific meaning, one not known of exoterically yet. Jupiter was associated also by the alchemists with the elemental metal iron opposite on the spectrum from Mercury, and modern esotericists recognize the same polar relationship between Muladhara and Pratilahara, the lowest and highest chakras. The reason for this is not because the planet Jupiter is farther from the solar system's offset center than the planet Mercury. It is because of the Kamiya. The Kamiya, or magic number square associated with Jupiter, is second of the planetary Kamiyas, a square of four by four. The Kamiya are undoubtedly ancient, but their understanding has never been fully accounted for. They were known in linear form to Francis Barrett and are, according to E. A. Wallace Budge, at least as old as Sumer and India. However, their exact origins are unknown. Tellingly, the place in the zodiac given for each planetary cameo has additional writing within the geometric sigil. This writing is, of course, indecipherable and is likely the contemporary of ancient Hebrew and linear A and B and is decidedly pre-Phoenician. It seems possible that the seven sigils on the places in the zodiac are actually the ancient prototypes of the modern alphabets. However, this is mere speculation. What is not mere speculation is that there has been a political movement over the last 200 years to restore ideals of society that were considered Atlantean, even by Solon, the father of Greek democracy. The major difference between the movement for Atlantean restoration and the origins of the Kamiya in history is found in the Bible. According to the Hebrews, the events immediately prior to Abraham's expulsion from Ur in Sumer was the building by the people of the Tower of Babel and the dispersion of the peoples following the confusion of the tongues. Abraham, known as Ibruim in contemporary Sumerian records, was the scribal priest of Enlil, the chief deity of Akkad, north of Sumer. As such, he was opposed to the Babylonian expansion that was then overwhelming Kish. In the Bible, the Old Testament of Abraham's peoples, these events are described as the first exile of the people when Abraham entered Egypt as Imhotep, builder of the Pyramid of Djoser. Later on, following the exodus out of Egypt and the building of the first temple, Babylon was still around. This was the time of the Babylonian captivity of the Israelites. However, at the time of Abraham, the threat of Babylon was only just emerging. Therefore, the event described as preceding his expulsion from Ur 
was the building of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the tongues. At the same time as Abraham left Ur, Lot left Sodom. Just as the Tower of Babel was destroyed, so too was Sodom destroyed. This was when the cameo was first described. Thus, the modern sigils in the places of the zodiac we have to describe the cameo are only as old as later Sumer and are not authentically Atlantean. Of course, because the arrangement of the sigils on the places of the zodiac is based on the arrangement of the number squares comprising the cameo, then there is no way to date when the information of this certain arrangement first became known. That is why we, the Illuminati, consider the cameo to be of the true Atlantis, that is, timeless. The Jupiter do guard place in the zodiac is depicted in red on the diagram associated with the illuminati degree here we see the seven places in the zodiac of the planetary cameo are attributed to the seven colors and these arranged in a circle around the geometric pattern formed from the arrangement by ratio of the number of squares the fact that there are seven places in the zodiac, each with its own accompanying indecipherable sigil, indicates that the artifact unearthed by the Essenes was signed by seven rulers. To speculate, these are seven of the ten supposedly Atlantean kings from before the deluge does not mean the seven sigils on the Camion necessarily correspond to names of the antediluvian rulers on the Sumerian kings list. We cannot say with certainty when the sigils were inscribed. What we do know is that the places in the zodiac of the planetary sigils are based on an arrangement of the Camion number squares according to ratios. We know that the base 7 and 12 systems can interrelate in various other arrangements also, but that the one of these that follows most logically from the cameo arrangement of number squares is one that is not yet properly known of among the Christians and the chattel. It positions the seven planets as bars across a circular zodiac, uniting mere opposite signs. This arrangement has only been implied thus far to the chattel and the Christian Kabbalists by Francis Barrett's linear array of the seven planetary sigils. According to Barrett's linear array, planetary Jupiter rules over Pisces and Sagittarius on the zodiac. However, it is clear here that Barrett is attempting to fuse the two systems of Jupiter, the planet, attributed to the letter Tao, and to the Sephirot judgment or mercy, and Jupiter the four square, base seven, sigil camia, and its place in the zodiac. However, we should be able to rightly see that the zodiac of the camia number squares arrangement, and the zodiac of the constellations in the Empyrean Heights do not necessarily correspond to one another in a one-to-one -one ratio. Instead, it seems likely to us as Illuminati that the cameo refers to the microscopic as the constellations refer to the macroscopic. Jupiter governs over Pisces and Sagittarius. Pisces is a water sign. Sagittarius is an air sign. Now we know that in our year, Sagittarius precedes Pisces by less than Pisces precedes Sagittarius. At this point, in the passage of the Aeons, the constellation we call Pisces, the twin fish, is associated with the flooding of late winter, early spring. 
as such, when the solar age is Pisces, it will be the end of an ice age in the North Hemisphere. Likewise, when the solar age is Sagittarius, a sign of early winter and later autumn, we recognize as dominant an archetype that, currently, we depict as a centaur archer. So why is it that the exoteric manifestations, the invisible hands of Jupiter, are expressed as twin fish and a horseman? It is not because of the planetary attributes of Jupiter, associating the red-spotted giant with Zeus, the Olympian dignitary of dignitaries. It is because these are the signs on either end when a horizontal bar is drawn across the ecliptic and attributed to Jupiter. The reason for this is the camia. By tracing the mysterious origins of this symbol, the barred zodiac, we can determine the origin dates of knowledge of the Kamiya. This places the first knowledge of the base 7 and 12 systems at the same time as the conception of the modern Hebrew Aleph Bet, wherein Jupiter is equivalent to the letter Tau. The date of the origins of the modern Hebrew Aleph Bet as Aramaic are contemporary to the beginning of Phoenician, following the use of hieroglyphics in Egypt. This corresponds to the end of the Old Kingdom in Egypt and the beginning of the Pharaonic Age, the building of massive pyramids designed by Imhotep, and the first expulsion of Abraham and Lot from Sumer and Akkad. That is why Kabbalist scholars of the Sephardic school were unable to trace the Kamiya back any farther than the time of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the tongues. It is because this is the earliest they can trace back the use of the barred circle zodiac symbol to represent the Kamiya. However, as we Illuminati know, this does not mean the true Kamiya that of the arrangement of number squares by ratio, was unknown of before that point. It only proves that it was at the time of the Tower of Babel that the translation of the Kamiya into modern Hebrew could be attributed. So, we can say that the Kamiya was known of at the very beginning of the recorded history of our modern post-flood era, this implies, thus, that it was known of before the Flood as well, even though any record of its being known would have been lost at that time. Now we Illuminati know that the Kamiya is the foundation cornerstone of Atlantean democracy. However, the difficulty we encounter, and on a daily basis, is exemplified by trying to explain this to the common people that is, the exoteric chattel or the drones of modern civilization. The trick is to get them to work upon the project without knowing what, in the end, it will be. This is because of their greed. If they were to learn their work would be used to make their superiors immortal, they would desire immortality for themselves. So, too, the restoration of Atlantis rendering the presence of all mankind eternal would so appeal to the common workers on the great work that they would desire to design it in their own image and thus to rule over the entirety. Because we cannot allow this to happen, there are some things that we Illuminati do not talk about with the chattel. One of them is the way in which Atlantean democracy is founded on the cornerstone of the Kamiya. Another is the true meaning of the clear light, that it is fifth dimensional. We do not talk about phi over pi to the chattel, and we do not subscribe to their definitions of God. We do not show them certain signs and seals such as the solar symbol of the Illuminati, 
and if they happen to find these out from us, we explain the symbols to the chattel incorrectly, to confuse them into awe. We can explain the solar symbol first as a cone, then the triangle as a sign of dialectics, argue Marx and Rand with them, but we will never be able to explain to them the meaning of the rotation of the barred zodiac according to the dual twist method of depiction according to Crowley in the Book of Thoth, not unless they are willing to quit being chattel and become an Illuminatus. That is why we look toward Pisces and Sagittarius, to conquer, divide. So, when air and earth, archer and steed of Sagittarius, are divided, they become the twin water sign, the two fish of Pisces. This indicates that when these signs were formulated, Pisces represented the spring equinox sign, both water, and that Sagittarius was between the autumnal equinox, more earth, and the winter solstice, more air. Of course, this relationship fails to matter compared to what weather these signs denote to the common mind currently. Likewise, just as at the time of the beginning of the Babylonian zodiac, the twelve signs were fixed to the four elements in the form of the four seasons. So, in modern times, the ancient Babylonian zodiac can be associated with the planetary base seven system through the relationship between the base four elements, esoterically the four worlds of Kabbalah, and the base three alchemical elements, esoterically the elements of the four worlds. Because three plus four equals seven, and three times four equals twelve, then we see the base seven and base twelve systems connecting quite easily in the realm of mathematics, and already we have the preserved fragments of the artifact, the places in the zodiac, and the Atlantean sigils. Thus, just as by adding 3 plus 7 plus 12, we arrive at the 22 of the Hebrew Aleph bet, so too do we arrive at 23 when we add 5 times 4 to 3. These are the mysteries of our magic numbers. Only understand, there is no point trying to tell the chattel about these types of things they will not understand. They will tell you the old ways are better, referring to the Dark Ages. But we Illuminati are here to restore the Atlantean rule of one, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, rules over the nation that aligns itself with these, his ideals. The chattel only understand the opposite form of logic. The all-seeing eye is printed on money. They will see this as evil, placing a sign of the divine on the very surface of the most profane. However, with only a little coaxing, they will come to understand the eye in the triangle does not represent the divine, but a lesser form or state of the divine. Rather than representing omniscience bound, we can tell them, and quite rightly, that it is merely the modern symbolic equivalent of the binding through labor of the deity known in Akkad as Shamash, in Sumer as Utu, and in Babylon as Marduk. By binding Marduk, we can explain to them, we place yad he vad -He supernal to Cthulhu. We can even show them a picture of a pyramid above a labyrinth to stimulate their minds. All this can be done easily enough by us now, but what cannot be done by anyone to our knowledge at this time is to explain to a chattel drone 
The true old ways were the way of light and the law of one. The final attribute under the auspices of Illuminism is Chia. Chia is the lesser will. Jikaida is the greater will. The lesser will is like a wild animal. The greater will is that beast's trainer. Out of love for the animal, it must be whipped and conditioned and molded into obedience, even if, throughout that time, the punishments and rewards seem arbitrary to the animal, and it does not understand why its master is showing it tough love. Why is this? What is the reason for this? It is because otherwise the wild animal would eat the one who instead trains it. Consider the tamed lion. It could easily, if so prompted, devour the flesh of a man in under a minute. However, it is as totally subservient as a common pet. Why is this? Because it has realized the freedom of home. This is like Chia. Chia is the lion with two faces, one tamed, one savage. The Chia is the home of man's highest spirit, of the Kabbalah, the lowest parts, the Kab Allah, flesh of God. That is why the lion is both savage and tamed, because Chia is home to man's highest spirit and to God's lowest flesh. Just as the spirit of a man may seem tamed, it is nothing beside how fair is the Lord. And this is very good, for God has given each of his angels right judgment, that is, mercy, and his own ideas see out through their eyes. So, Thoth and Shiva may serve us just as much as Michael or Jesus, for all are spirits of the realm of Neshima. For some of those spirits have fallen and seek to deceive us and draw us away from the clear light, either when we choose to or only if we have become very deceived do we incarnate. So we say that some spirits of the realm of pure geometry, the fifth dimension, that of the pure light, are guides to the realms of purity, even greater than that of invisible geometric light. Others, however, try to drag us downward and back into the realms of fourth dimensional electromagnetic entropy. Those for whom we feel pity are angels of the Lord, too, but, like Satan tempting us to avoid charity, they cling to our sorrows and leave a trail of effect behind us. However, whether the Grigori or fallen Anunnaki spirits or those of Jakaida will guide us in our will, our chia, our gut instinct, is determined by our own level of enlightenment of the watchful eye over them. The Jakaida, or True Will, the Holy Guardian Angel, peak transcendental experience level of each and every little speck of an individual, is higher than even the spirit of man, which is governed over by the alignment of the lesser willed Chia. However, remember that the spirit, or highest conceptual aspect of man, is only the lowest flesh of Kabbalah. This is not, as some might assume, because God is upside down from the transcendental ascension of man. That is Satan, also known in this case as the constellation Orion. God is both rising and falling at once, as well as neither rising, and only either or the other. He is all these things. His is the ultimate will 
of which Jakaida is only one small ripple of a reflection. However, Jakaida, the holy guardian angel, is the highest will of man. Beyond this, one ceases to be mortal, or rather, ceases to see their self-concept mortality as central. The self-concept of themselves as mortal is contingent on the degradation of their DNA. If the DNA's lifespan were prolonged naturally, the thoughts of mortality would begin to fade, and if the DNA's lifespan were prolonged indefinitely by artificial means, then the mind would be completely transformed into a non-mortal entity, as it truly is anyway, since the mind is only a part of the body so long as the body is alive, but that beyond this in the form of energy and then in the form of only a pattern of clear light the mind does live on after this the mind as it is now descended into the thrice cursed body the thrice descended pit below the soul has its true throne of origin above the one body above the many bodies above the many souls above the one soul. Truly, the spirit, the pure geometric pattern, or Neshima, clear light of man, is ever bowed before Jakaida, the gates of the realm in which dwells the Most High and the Holy Host. Just as the soul is immortal by nature, so too can the mind's lowest concept of itself also become immortal, even seemingly eternal, but on a cosmic scale, such spans mean nothing. Truly, the immortality of the soul will outlast any form of immortality of the body, and the eternity of the spirit, of the tamed Chia aligned with Jakaida, the holy guardian angel will outlast even the longest conceptual extension of the immortal soul by an even exponentially greater duration. So too is the spirit, the geometry of phi over pi, the clear light of the fifth dimension, nothing before the almighty ascension of God. That is why we, true Illuminati, scoff even at the quest for life extension of the Rosicrucian alchemists, because we know it is our deeds that determine our destiny, and not our interior designs. Just as there is no one right interior form, neither of DNA nor of thought, there can be no one right being to ascend to the nether realms. All we need to shape tomorrow is here, now. To embrace any form of immortality is to cling to the notion of mortality. In other words, the Chia is tamed when it realizes that it must compromise upon serving time as an angel in the realm of Neshima, either as an Anunnaki, one of the fallen and perpetually lamenting, or as a holy guardian angel over a lesser soul. Only then can the spirit rightly be saved from this willing compromise and ascend into the realms of Jakaida. This is the noble beast, heart of an Illuminati. When you know this, you will know to whom to give what grip, and when saluting anyone, you shall know who among them can see by the shining. This concludes the knowledge lecture on the traits of the perfect Illuminati.